So today I want to finish the discussion I uh, started about the Amabi problem, and uh, in fact, I prepared a couple of slides to just revo remind you what I'd done at the end of uh, the lecture last time, which was that we were interested in uh, uh, this equation, which had a geometric meaning, that it said that if you start with a background metric G0 for the moment on a compact smooth manifold, you can formally change it, just multiplying by a smooth positive function, uh, and if that function satisfies this equation where that R sub G, which is a priori mysterious, is just required to be constant, then you found a constant scalar curvature metric. Okay? And the interesting thing was exactly that this exponent is known as the critical Sobolev exponent for this type of equation. Uh, the scheme that Yamabe uh, envisioned was to look at this energy, interpret this as the Euler-Lagrange equation for the energy, and find minimizers. Now, there's a, an evolved theory that's uh, come a long ways about finding higher critical points, but the very first thing you might try to do is just find minimizers. So define y, which is an invariant of the conformal class, to be the minimum of the energy in that conformal class. So on any manifold, and you're in dimensions three and above, I didn't mention, there's infinitely many, well, there's an infinite dimensional family of conformal classes. Each one of them has one of these y's att attached to it. Okay. Um, when M is compact and smooth, this energy is always bounded below on any given conformal class. And it's always less than, the minimum is always less than or equal to the value on the sphere. And the sign of that, of that uh, Yamabe constant for a conformal class is, well, as I said, uniquely determined by the uh, uh, conformal class. And there's a trichotomy that, that that constant can either be negative, zero, or positive. Now, if it's negative, uh, you know, let's say once you found a, a constant negative curvature, uh, a constant negative scalar curvature metric, then you multiply by any constant, you can get any other negative constant, similarly with positive or zero. So it's only the sign that's really interesting. And it turns out that every manifold admits most of its conformal classes are negative, right? And there are severe topological restrictions for there to be positive or zero conformal. Well, zero is a little bit less restrictive, but positive conformal classes, they're none. So in fact, you know, in dimension three, for example, uh, this is a result of Perelman's work, a, a three-manifold, a compact smooth three-manifold, which admits a positive Yamabe metric, has to be a connected sum of space forms. So quotients, S3 mod gamma and S2 cross S1, take a finite connected sum of those, and those are the only guys that admit positive scalar curvature metrics. Okay, um, as I pointed out, this problem turns out to be solvable in all cases, though it's uh, kind of an interesting story how that comes out to be the case. So now, in the case where M has uh, isolated conic singularities, uh, I let n be the link at the conic point, and we're interested in the Yamabe energy of that link. So that turns out to be the operative feature. And if that Yamabe energy is uh, negative, so this is what I say here. Um, do I say that? Right, so if the Yamabe energy is negative, or zero is slightly different problems, but if the Yamabe energy of the link is negative, then the Yamabe energy of the full manifold is minus infinity. The, the infimum of Yamabe energies, okay? So somehow if you want to find a minimizer, you better stick to the case where the, the cross-section is, well, one of these positive scalar curvature metrics. So, you know, what I have here is, uh, you know, some conic point, and instead of, you know, so there's some sort of complicated uh, cross-section, whatever it is. This is going to go down history as the, the single most drawn picture in this conference, right? A cone. <laughs> uh, indicative of general singularities everywhere. Um, if that cross-section doesn't satisfy this topological constraint of having a positive sc scalar curvature metric, you should just stop there because you're not going to solve this problem. Okay? So um, the theorem is that if the Yamabe energy for that conformal class of the conic manifold is strictly less than these two numbers together, the minimum of these two numbers, and is finite, then you get existence. And the scheme was exactly the same. You look at a minimizing sequence, and as long as you can prevent this bubbling from occurring, namely the sequence from starting to inflate wildly at some point, then you win. You can take a limit, and, and that's your solution. Now, it turns out that the first inequality, being less than y of Sn, prevents bubbling at an interior point, and the second inequality prevents bubbling at the conic point. Okay. So um, then the last thing I pointed out last time was, can we characterize the case of, of equality? And all we have is a tantalizing clue that it's going to be a complicated story. So unfortunately, I, there are no results about this, just the fact that uh, you know, we know that the case of equality we cannot characterize as we can in the compact smooth case. So there's probably some very interesting geometry there, but nobody knows what it is yet. OK, plunging ahead fearlessly. Um, so this is work I've done with uh, Kazuo Kurigawa and Gilles Caron. And so I was interested in, you know, Extending everything to stratified spaces, you know, why not? Oops. Excuse me. 
<laughs> it's fine, Gerardo. <laughs> Uh, and so what we realized sort of very early on was we should generalize further than stratified spaces and look at things that are sort of, you know, quite singular. So what I call almost Riemannian metric measure spaces. So there's a large study of analysis in what are called metric measure spaces. So spaces that have a metric in the space of, you know, metric spaces and a measure that are, you know, have, may or may not be compatible. The Riemannian moniker is meant to suggest that you have a, you have a thing, you know, some space which is mostly a smooth manifold. Right, but then there's a bunch of singular glop on the boundary. But you don't have any sort of a priori control of that singular glop. Right, you're going to make a few axioms about what it has to satisfy. But there has to be a metric that's defined on the whole manifold, and it has to be compatible with the Riemannian metric in the interior smooth bits. Okay, and uh, the Riemannian measure has to be well, at least smoothly equivalent to the, uh, the 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 mu that you're imposing. Okay, so that's the type of space that we're looking at. So of course, any stratified space in the sense I've been talking about satisfies this, but there's lots of other examples too, including you know Lipschitz domains and you know things like that. Uh, so. Uh, you can define this scalar curvature, and you, you know there are ways that you might envision defining the curvature by getting distributional uh, uh, contributions at the singularities, and we're not doing that. So we're just interested in the scalar curvature on the smooth bit, where you know defining it is no big deal. And the question is, can one solve the Yamabe problem in this in this context? Okay, uh, and so um, here's our result. So first of all, for any point P, including if it's a singular point, because we have a metric, we know what we mean by the ball of radius epsilon. Okay? Now, what I can do is I can take the Yamabe energy of functions which are compactly supported in that ball, so QG naught of U. So I take all functions U which are non-negative, supported uh, away from the singular set, right, and which vanish on the boundary of the ball the outer boundary of the ball. So the, the inner, you know, the center of the ball might be singular, the singularities might run elsewhere, but I look at all functions like this, and I define that to be the Yamabe energy of the ball, and then I take the infimum over all such things. Okay? And then what I do is take the limit of, uh, so uh, to point out that this Yamabe energy has, has sort of a conformal meaning, what I can do is I can take the pointed gromov hausdorff limit of these balls. So just think of taking a ball inflating the metric, that's just like expanding the ball, right? and what I, all I'm really doing is in the sense of taking the tangent cone at that singular point, well, at the smooth point or the singular point. Okay? So all this is saying is that the Yamabe energy of a ball is the same as the Yamabe energy of any dilate of the ball, and in particular, it's going to be converging to the Yamabe energy of the tangent cone, any given tangent cone, at that singular point. Okay, so that's what we say here. And now what I do is I define the local Yamabe uh, the local Yamabe constant of the singular space with a given conformal class as the infimum over all points of the limit as epsilon goes to zero of these Yamabe energies of the ball. So what I'm doing is sort of taking the infinitesimal Yamabe energy at any point. Okay. Now let's think what that is in a smooth manifold. If I'm on a smooth manifold, then any point looks like any other, and for a small ball, I can inflate it. The tangent cone at, that, at a small ball is Euclidean space, just Rn, and this is this thing would just be the Yamabe energy of Rn, or the Yamabe energy of Sn, the Yamabe constant of, of Rn. Okay, so if I'm at a smooth point, this limit is exactly, uh, you know, for a given p, that limit is exactly the Yamabe energy of Rn. If I'm at a conic point, that Yamabe energy is the Yamabe energy of the entire cone, the model cone at that point. Okay, and in general. Whatever the singular glop is, I just take the infimum over all points of the Yamabe energies of all the tangent cones. Okay, so that's in some sense, you know, you're, you're, this is kind of this universal classification of, you know, whatever the singularities are at every singular point, you take the tangent cone, you take the Yamabe energy of that scale invariant tangent cone, take the infimum over all those, and that's the local Yamabe invariant of the singular space. And so, as I pointed out, this is equal to the Yamabe invariant of Rn if you're at a smooth point a cone if you're at a singular point. And in general, if you're on a stratified space, then you know, if you take the tangent cone at a point, that tangent cone is exactly the cone cross Euclidean space. Right? If you're at a, at a singular point, then everything just sort of flattens out. So you get the entire cone cross Euclidean space. And that thing is conformal to, so uh, this is something I'd never really written down, but it's a rather important point. If I take C of Z cross RL, the metric is you know, DZ squared plus uh, times r squared plus r squared, uh, no, excuse me, plus dr squared, I'm sorry, plus dy squared. 
And if I just divide the whole thing by r squared, which is a conformal factor, I can group these two guys together, and it looks like the product of the compact manifold Z with hyperbolic space. So in fact, I can either think of this as the cone cross RL, or I can think of this as the compact manifold Z, or the stratified space Z, crossed with hyperbolic space. So I want to think of these as suspended Yamabe invariants. And these are the things that we're interested in, these suspended Yamabe invariants. OK, so here's the structural hypotheses on our space. So it has to be all fours n regular. So it has to have the property that the measure of balls is comparable to r to the n. There has to be a Sobolev of inequality, which is, in fact, a rather restrictive assumption on this space. So it turns out that Sobolev of inequalities preclude things like cusps right, uh, and various other exotic behavior. But you know, when you have it, it's a very strong thing. And then the third thing is that the scalar curvature has to be an LQ for some Q bigger than n over 2. Okay? If you're in a compact smooth space, you have all of these, obviously. Right? And these, in fact, are exactly the structural assumptions that you need. And so it's sort of the, uh, what I call these, these are the stripped down hypotheses. And these are exactly what make Trudinger's argument work for existence. So this is all you need. And like I said, I mean, Trudinger's argument itself was rather lengthy, being in the early days of the subject. And the Kutagawa uh, um, uh, Botvinnik argument, where they were doing this on conic spaces, was also rather lengthy. But at the end of the day, this is all that any of them needs. So uh, our theorem is this that if the Yamabe energy is finite and strictly less than this local Yamabe energy. Okay, so this is some invariant of the space that captures what's happening at each of the singular points. If you have strict inequality here, then you can make this whole process run with just these three axioms. So you need axioms one through three, and you need this, uh, this inequalities on both sides, strict inequalities on both sides, then the minimization procedure just works. Okay. Uh, so in particular, you can prevent bubbling at all points. And furthermore, the solution is bounded uniformly above and below. The upper bound comes out of this Moser iteration argument, and the lower bound comes out of a very clever adaptation of that that Matt Gursky developed several years ago, well, yeah, 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, so what that actually tells you is because the conformal factor is bounded away from zero and away from infinity, mg is quasi-asymmetric to the original metric. So I've accomplished what I wanted to do, which was find a metric which has the same rough geometry. It's quasi-asymmetric to the thing I started with, and it has constant scalar curvature. OK, so any mention of stratified spaces here was completely gratuitous, because you know, all we needed were these other axioms. However, in the case of stratified spaces, you can ask, uh, let me see, and I just want to um, say, so I'm going to say a few things here. So when m is stratified, then in fact, it's clear that you have this all fours n regularity, that balls grow like uh, r to the n. And the fact that the Sobel of inequality is true on any stratified space with an iterated edge metric is true. It needs a little bit of proof. Uh, and I don't think it had ever been recorded before, but it's not very hard. Um, so maybe because I want to talk about something else, I'm going to sort of give some of this short shrift just to point out that on stratified spaces, you can get a great refinement of this theorem. So, you know, the moral of this story that I wanted to say was that, you know, the, the existence theory that we have uses sort of much more general machinery that makes no mention of stratifications, right? It just, it holds in general. But all the axioms can be verified on stratified spaces, and you can refine the result a great deal in a couple of different ways. Uh, in particular, you can identify these local Yamabe invariants as these sort of suspended Yamabe invariants uh, of the type here. And rather interestingly, these, these things have come about uh, in other people's work on, um, so other people have been looking at exactly these same invariants, looking at surgery on, uh, on manifold deposit scalar curvatures. So this is actually a rather hot field now in, uh, in algebraic topology, of trying to understand how you can surgery together manifolds of positive scalar curvature. And it turns out that they have to consider exactly these same suspended Yamabe invariants. Okay. Unfortunately, Nobody knows how to compute them. There's some estimates, but they're very hard to compute. OK, so there's a lot I'm sort of omitting here. There's sort of a very nice regularity theory. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of mention this as something where, you know, so it's a nice technique that uh, really sort of goes towards, you know, the more general philosophy of doing analysis on metric measure spaces with a little bit more structure than that. Um, and uh, one's able to get a rather satisfactory theory in general but then it specializes in a very particular way uh, on stratified spaces. Yeah, Thomas. Uh, yes, so in fact, so these were the slides I quickly went over. They're polyhomogeneous if you play your cards right. So, you know, if your initial metric is, you know, regular, then it's conormal or polyhomogeneous. Yeah, so yeah, and that's part of the theory that you can do. 
That's exactly right. Okay, so I, I went over that shortly because I wanted to have time to talk about my last topic here, which is um, this, Keeler-Einstein metrics on metrics with edges. So the reason I wanted to talk about this, so the last nonlinear example I wanted to mention because I liked it because it worked in such great generality. And, you know, it's, well, it's not a complete answer, but it's sort of, a, I think, a reasonable theorem. This is a, a new theorem that, well, it's about a year old now. And this really uses the full force of everything I know about edge calculus. Okay, so this is sort of, uh, you know, I won't go so far as to dignify it with the deep theorem, but it's something that, you know, a lot of people had tried to do using other techniques, and this is a place where the edge calculus really played a huge role, okay? And I even got other people to admit that, grudgingly. So um, let me describe the <laughs> let me describe the context. So this is an old problem, you know, a very famous problem in complex uh, geometry. So take a compact Kähler manifold. So this is a complex manifold that has a metric of a very special sort. So the metrics we're interested in uh, G, G, I, J bar, have the property that locally you can write G, I, J bar as uh, uh, the complex Hessian of a function. Okay? So somehow there's a scalar, a scalar function underlying the metric. Okay? And you can modify it, so the analog of a conformal change of metric is modifying, so there's a phi missing right here, but I can take my metric G, I, J bar and add to it the complex Hessian of some other function and get a new metric. This is called changing the metric in the same Kähler class. Okay? So even though I've written things down in, in local coordinates, this turns out to be a well-defined global thing to do. Okay? So in other words, I'm taking gij bars, which look like just you know, d squared phi dzi dzj bar, and there's a convexity hypothesis. I want that Hessian to be positive definite. Right? So that's requiring the function to be somehow convex everywhere. Okay, so um, this is the basic setup, and you know, this is sort of the central object of study in, in uh, complex geometry, and, uh, and impinges has a lot of applications to, to algebraic geometry and beyond. So a standard fact, and this is really some sort of generalization of the Gauss-Binet theorem, if you haven't seen this, it's a, you know, it's a characteristic class calculation, is if I take the Ricci tensor associated to this metric, then it turns out to be a topological invariant. So in general, the Ricci tensor of a, of a metric is, you know, you take all the sectional curvatures, you average all the sectional curvatures that contain a given line, and that defines a bilinear form, which, you know, acts on that line, you polarize, and so on. In the complex case, there's a remarkable formula that tells you that rho sub g is going to be, again, given by the complex Hessian of some function. In fact, what you do is you take the determinant of gij bar, so you just take the determinant of this thing, take its square root, I think, take its logarithm, and you take its complex Hessian, and that is exactly the form rho sub g. So that's a, a one, one form, a two form, that uh, represents and this is the theorem, that two form always represents a topological, well, it's an invariant of the complex structure, C1 of M. So this is the first Turing class of the complex tangent bundle, or the anti-canonical bundle. So something related directly to the complex structure. Okay, now, by the way, just when I say a 1-1 one, one form, we're looking at differential forms. We're in the complex category, so we have variables Z1 through Zn. Then when we have their complex conjugates, Z1 bar through Zn bar. And a 1-1 one, one form involves, you know, DZI wedge DZJ bar, one of each. Okay, so it's a particular part of the grading. And the metric is called Kähler-Einstein. So this is the Einstein condition um, just in the category of Kähler metrics. If this Ricci form, which is a 1-1 one, one form, is equal to a constant multiple of the metric. Well, I turn the metric into a 1, 1 form. So I, I take this gij bar, this guy, and I just think of it as the coefficients of a form, dzi wedge dzj bar rather than dzi tensor dzj bar. Okay? And I want these two forms to be multiples of one another. Rho is equal to mu times omega. Okay, so if we want to have a Kähler-Einstein metric, well, you notice here that this omega corresponds to a positive definite metric. Okay? So if this is going to be true, then either rho looks like it's positive definite, right? or zero. So if mu is zero, then the Ricci form is zero, or it's cohomologous to zero, because it's only its cohomology class is well defined. Uh, if it's not equal to zero, and if you have a chance of solving this, well, if mu is positive, that means that rho as a form has to either be positive definite, or it has to be cohomologous to something that's positive definite. Okay? So there's an obstruction, which is that you, you say that the, this class C1 of M has to contain representatives, which are either zero, positive definite, or negative definite. So this is just sort of an obvious obstruction that you need to, need to deal with. If 
you're going to solve this problem. But the question is, and this goes back to, I don't know, the late 50s, Kalabi originally posed this, uh, and he, you know, would like to disavow any knowledge of, well, he just said, you know, just a question he raised, but it turned out to generate an enormous amount of research over uh, many years after that, which is, if you have a compact Kähler manifold and you have this obvious sign condition, or C1 is equal to zero, then the question is, can you find a function in the same, you know, can you find a metric in the same Kähler class which satisfies the Einstein condition? Okay, now this is really, you know, the great, glorious generalization of the uniformization theorem to higher dimensions. This is the one where it's sort of most well posed. So, you know, the Einstein condition is really the right, in the, in the scale of constant curvature metrics, I told you with constant scalar curvature, there's way too many of them. There's one in every conformal class. It, it, it doesn't tell you very much about the manifold. If you demand constant sectional curvature, that's way too stringent. It rarely happens. Okay? Constant Ricci curvature is really the right condition. And what's nice about the complex setting is that it turns, to, turns out to be an equation on a scalar function phi. So it's not an equation on tensors. So the real Einstein equations, you know, I think we still have very little real idea about the structure of them in higher dimensions. You know, there are very fundamental questions like, does every manifold of dimension five and above admit Einstein metrics? You know, nobody knows. And nobody even knows if that's a reasonable question. Okay, but in any case, in the complex category, this was a reasonable question. And uh, so you can phrase it for Kähler Einstein, or you can try to prescribe the Ricci curvature in the C1 equals zero case. And as I say, this has driven an enormous amount of research, both in uh, fully nonlinear equations and in complex geometry. The reason it's so important in complex geometry is the minute you have a Kähler Einstein metric, then it allows you to sort of say it, it, it provides extremely strong classification theorems. So this is sort of the big interest. Yeah? They're negatives of each other. I forget which is which. Yeah. So C1 positive means you're in the Fano case, and C1 negative means you're in the general type case. C1 equals zero, you know, the Kalabi Yau case. <laughs> Uh, no, it's C1 of a higher rank vector bundle. Oh, no, I mean, if the canonical bundle is, yeah, then it's C1 of a line bundle. Yeah, forgive me. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. So that's the geometric setup. If you like that sort of thing, there it is. If you just like PDEs, here it is. Here's the PDE. Um, so it's a complex Mangin-Pair equation. You take the metric GIJ bar. You're looking for a phi that satisfies, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It'll be in it. There'll be in it. There'll be singularity soon enough. <laughs> but right now it's compact. Okay, so here's the complex Mangin pair equation. So uh, you take the determinant of the Hessian, you know, with these sort of extra factors, and this is supposed to equal an exponential. Okay, so when mu is equal to zero, remember mu is the Einstein constant, so this could be positive, negative, or zero. So when mu is equal to zero, this just looks like an inhomogeneous Mangin pair equation. When mu is plus or minus one, then, uh, you know, that's some zeroth order term. So F is just some sort of measure of the deviation of the original metric from being Kähler-Einstein. So in particular, if G itself were Kähler-Einstein, then there you'd have a solution with phi is equal to zero, which would mean that determinant of G divided by determinant of G is one. F would be zero. So F is just sort of the discrepancy from G itself being Kähler-Einstein. Okay, so um, as I say, there are many motivations. I want to mention just a few. One of the applications that got a lot of airplay was uh, these so-called bogomolov miyako yao inequalities, which were inequalities on in the Turing classes. They have very strong consequences in classification theory of, uh, of complex manifolds, complex surfaces. And it turns out that if you have a Kähler-Einstein metric, then you can prove such inequalities. Okay? Um, so that was one of Yao's original motivations. Uh, as I say, there's sort of classification results that you know, if you have a negative Kähler-Einstein metric, you pass to the universal cover, you can prove that certain manifolds are biholomorphic to quotients of the unit ball in CN, which is a very strong rigidity theorem, too. So there are many uses for these things, and uh, uh, they've been very central in complex geometry, uh, and they've been very central in fully nonlinear analysis, too. So again, this is one of these cases where the geometry of the problem really sort of unlocked a lot of analytic techniques, which have now taken on a life of their own. And, you know, there's sort of a huge field of fully nonlinear equations, which has always had a, a close connection to complex and real mangin pair equations. So the case where mu is negative was understood by Aubin and Yao uh, in the 70s. Yao resolved the case where mu is equal to zero. That's what he got his Fields Medal for. And mu positive has turned out to be the really hard case. So unlike the Yamabe problem, where there's sort of exactly one sort of uh, 
example that gives you trouble, namely the sphere, mu positive, there's a lot of obstructions, there's a lot of cases that give you trouble, and there's a lot of partial results right now, and so there's sort of a, an enormous research effort right now to try to finish this off. Uh, so um, Tian in his thesis in the late 80s understood the case of complex surfaces, so there are known obstructions, but he was able to say that modulo those known obstructions, which are a bit subtle to state, you always get existence of kähler einstein metrics with mu positive. Uh, and, you know, it's been, um, it's been a big field. So, uh, right, here's a bit of the, a bit of the history. Um, but the precise goal is to understand the obstructions to existence when mu is positive. Okay? So you'd like to understand uh, and hopefully characterize these conditions in terms of algebraic geometry. So the manifolds for which C1 of M is positive, you know what they are. They're, they're so-called Fano manifolds. So they're a very specific class of uh, manifolds. There's not too many of them. Right? You know what they are. And there is a set of conditions which you know are, uh, prohibit Kähler-Einstein metrics. And almost certainly those aren't quite enough, but you'd like to understand exactly what the full set of conditions are. And you'd like to characterize it in terms of you know, coherent sheaves or something else I can't understand. Okay? But you'd like to understand what those conditions are to prevent existence of Kähler-Einstein metrics. Or rather, you'd like to say that if your manifold doesn't have any of these obstructions, then you can find such a metric. You can solve this equation. Okay, so finally singularities arise. And here's the setup. So I want to talk about a manifold. So I guess I have a picture in the next slide. I want to talk about a Kähler manifold, but with a bunch of complex hypersurfaces sitting inside. So these are called divisors. So if I'm on a Riemann surface, these are just points. Okay, if I'm in a complex surface, namely four-dimensional real manifold, two-dimensional complex, then these are complex curves, namely real two-dimensional surfaces, and so on. Okay, they're co-dimension two in the real setting. And... Uh, what you're interested in is finding a collection of divisors uh, which have the property that, well, so this is just a description of how you can arrange these divisors to be. So this is sort of a local coordinate description. Any one divisor is the zero set of a complex function, of a complex coordinate. And the intersection of an L-fold an L fold intersection looks like where some collection, the Z, Z1 through ZL, vanish. And this is very much like the sort of description of corners I talked about the other day. The only point is that these are complex coordinates, not real coordinates. Okay? So, um, so let me see. I have a picture. Yeah, here's a picture to think about. So here you can have D1 and D2. Here's crossing divisors. What we're going to be looking for are Kähler-Einstein metrics which make a bend along the divisor. And in the previous slide, I'm going to tell you why we're interested in those. So this was a problem that Tian proposed in the uh, early 90s. Uh, and Donaldson sort of picked this up about five years ago, and there were sort of good reasons from three-dimensional hyperbolic uh, geometry to, to, to do this. But the question is, instead of just trying to find a Kähler-Einstein metric on the compact smooth manifold, find one that has a little bit of flexibility in it. Namely, you'd like to find a Kähler-Einstein metric which is bent along this collection of divisors. Okay? Now, why would you want to do that? And it turns out that, as I say here, it adds a small amount of flexibility to the problem. So... The, the, the difficulty is that, you know, if you're just on the manifold, non-singular manifold, there are all these possible obstructions you don't know what to do. If you add just a finite dimensional degree of freedom, which is what allowing this extra bending will do, then hopefully you can solve the problem. Okay? Well, you've solved the wrong problem. You found a manifold with you know, singularities. It still might be an interesting metric. It still might have applications. But, in fact, what uh, Donaldson's idea was was to say that uh, find a metric that's a little bit weaker than you'd like. So it's kind of like a generalized metric, but not too generalized. You have a very precise control of what the singularities look like. It just has these edge singularities along a divisor. And then you'd like to take the limit as the edge flattens out, as it becomes smooth. So that's the idea, and this is actually an old idea that goes back to Thurston in hyperbolic geometry. This is the topological condition that you have to satisfy in order to find a Kähler-Einstein metric that has this uh, property. So the betas or the cone angles are related to the cone angles. And here you have involved not only the manifold, but the first term classes of the line bundles associated to these divisors. Okay? So this allows you a slight, slightly greater flexibility. The case that you'd like to limit to is when all the betas go to 1, which is the cone angles flattening out to 2 pi. Okay? So there's the picture, as I said. And so there's, uh, this is maybe... Um, I won't belabor this too much, but Tian's program uh, was to understand these uh, uh, kähler einstein edge metrics, at least when mu is negative, understand the limit when beta tends to 1, 
And his application, he had a lot of, you know, he has a paper where he described a lot of sort of interesting churn number inequalities that you could prove on manifolds that, so remember I said you have these sort of funny Bogomolov, Nyako, Yao inequalities, and you can prove them if your manifold admits a Kähler Einstein metric. Okay? Now, if the manifold doesn't admit a Kähler Einstein metric, nobody knew whether these inequalities were true. But suppose you have a manifold that admits one of these bent Kähler Einstein metrics, you can prove the same inequalities and then take a limit. So even if the original smooth manifold didn't admit a Kähler Einstein metric, you would still get the inequalities as a consequence of the limiting process. Okay, so that, that was sort of one motivation. And here's just an example in complex geometry that there are manifolds which, uh, well, anyway, so blah, 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 a bunch of algebraic geometry language. But um, the point is there are examples that are known to be right at the border of being accessible by this technique. So they themselves definitely don't admit Kähler Einstein metrics, but there are limits of things which would under this speculative conjecture. No, 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 no. So the limit is, uh, I won't say a mystery yet, but that's, that's certainly um, part of the whole issue. So Donaldson came upon this sort of completely independently of Tian, and he was interested in uh, sort of, the under, you know, finally finishing the classification of the, of the Fano case, so namely the, the, the C1 positive case, so this is sort of big <laughs> open conjecture. And his idea was simply trying to find these metrics where, you know, the cone angle was very small, and hopefully this should be fairly easy to construct, I mean, or, you know, much easier than the full case, then start bending the cone angle, making it flatter and flatter. So you find a, a Kähler-Einstein metric which has very close to zero cone angle. There are good analytic reasons why that should be simpler than the general case. And as I said, having the cone angle along this collection of divisors gives you a certain finite dimensional amount more flexibility, and you might hope to solve this problem. Now you start bending it, making it flatter and flatter, making the cone angle closer to 2 pi. Well, either you win and you have a limit as the cone angle flattens out, in which case you're done, you found your Kähler-Einstein metric, and you have to prove regularity theorems like you're saying, or else something breaks down. Now, it turns out that, and this is sort of, uh, you know, exactly where the state of research is right now, understanding where the breakdown occurs and how it occurs. So you're, you're going to exhibit, you're going to, let's say, witness some sort of loss of compactness, typically. So as the cone angle starts unraveling, you know, as it starts flattening out, all of a sudden the divisor can start, you know, bubbling and doing something crazy. But it's something that you should be able to understand in terms of algebraic geometry, so in terms of stability of the underlying bundles. So that's the program. T uh, you know, let's say Donald knows exactly what's going on, he just can't quite prove it yet. But, you know, that's the setup. The divisors? Well, you know, there's not that many divisors on a given manifold. I mean, there's not that many families. The divisors are put there in order to loosen up the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not part of the final solution you want to get. However, the, the obstruction criteria that you often see, so, the you know, the... the, the uh, shall I say, the obstructions that are known that to, to, to prevent Kähler Einstein metrics are often in the form of, you know, there's some coherent sheaf that does blah, 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 but associated to that current, current coherent sheaf is a divisor. So these aren't sort of a shocking, you know, new appearance. It's reasonable that they. Well, I mean, the point is, I'm taking a general. I'm, so, first of all, there are examples where you do have smooth divisors. In general, you'll get divisors with normal crossings. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's okay. So, like I say, I mean, it won't be a... Well, I mean, it's known that... Um, right, so you can do a resolution singularities to get to it. Okay. So, yeah, there's technical issues there, but... Right, exactly. Exactly. But in general, it's enough to reduce to the smooth case, let's put it that way. So there's a lot of sort of stuff that's known about the algebraic geometry of Fano manifolds and what kind of divisors you expect and so on. So in fact, it's, in fact, it's known that you can get to, you can always reduce to this case where you have a finite number of normally, simple normal crossing divisors, which are each individually smooth. Okay, so as I just had mentioned briefly, there's a situation in a three-dimensional hyperbolic uh, geometry, which I'll, I'll just mention that you can take hyperbolic metrics which are sort of bent along a geodesic. And Thurston had studied these back in the 70s as one of his many paths to try to understand you know, um, you know, geometrization. And uh, while it hadn't quite panned out at that time, it turned out to be an intriguing geometric problem. And there's, um, and I think, in, in the, um, maybe I'll say uh, a little bit more about that. So, so what you're interested in is, so a three-dimensional hyperbolic manifold, and it can be sort of bent along not just a geodesic 
So co-dimension two again, but it might be sort of a whole network of geodesics which meet at a singularity. Okay? Now it turns out that you can find such things with cone angle very small by a very simple, simple perturbative argument. You take a complete hyperbolic metric where these singularities are out at infinity, and you do a Dane surgery to close this cusp, and then you, you wind with something that's an edge or some sort of an iterated edge object. The singularities are a long ways away, and there's a very tight cone angle. And then, same idea, you try to bend the hyperbolic structure to make the cone angle flatter and flatter. And you try to see, ideally, you get a hyperbolic metric on the smooth manifold at the end of the day, or there's some sort of breakdown, and you can analyze that. And so now, after the fullness of the past 30, 40 years, that procedure is now pretty well understood, and it's possible. Uh, and it's both topological and, and uh, analytic. And in fact, um, there are various results. So the analysis, uh, Hodgson, Craig Hodgson and my colleague Steve Kirchhoff had, had looked at a case where the divisor was smooth. Hartman Weiss had looked at the case where you have simple branching singularities. And then these two papers allowed for sort of more complicated singular sets. Okay? But this is exactly, it's sort of a finite dimensional version of what I want to tell you in the Kähler-Einstein category. Hyperbolic metrics are in some sense kind of, hyper, you know, there's a finite dimensional space underlying that, and you want to deform in that finite dimensional space. Okay, so let me get back to the Kähler-Einstein program. So here's uh, sort of what was known, uh, and there was, you know, last year there was a lot of activity in this. So Donaldson came up with this program that, you know, we should be trying to find these Kähler-Einstein metrics of the edges. Uh, Tian and his student, Athalia uh, Jeffers, had looked at these in the mid-90s, and uh, she and I had, had worked on this problem back in the uh, late 90s, and, uh, you know, we announced something which, we ne which never quite panned out, let me just say politely. Um, but, uh, so, and it sat there for over 10 years. So, uh, Donaldson went around giving a lot of talks on this in the past few years, and, and so a lot of people and uh, specialists in singular Mont-Jean-Pair equations got into the job. And so these guys, Campagna, Canancia, and Paun, found a very beautiful theorem by sort of an approximation technique. So they were actually able to solve this problem with general divisors. And what they did is you think of these divisors as currents, as distributions. You approximate them by smooth functions. You use pluripotential theory, and you take a limit of smooth solutions to the Mont-Jean-Pair equation, and you get a limit. And the problem is, is that their method gives absolutely no information about the geometry of the limit, except that it's singular along these divisors. Okay, so they get a nice existence theorem, but it's not, uh, uh, that's not um, um, good enough for the application, shall we say. Uh, then Donaldson um, wrote a very brilliant short paper uh, just over a year ago where he uh, studied the local deformation theory. So it wasn't existence, but it's exactly the step of suppose you have one with a given cone angle, what do you need to do to bend it a little bit? You know, can you do, can, you know the openness part of the bending argument. And uh, you have to say, this is one of these great eureka moments, because as I said, worked on this problem in the late 90s. My ideas had kind of stalled out. And, you know, I looked at, you know, I have to say, is about one page more than the abstract of Donaldson's paper. And I went, you know, Jesus, what was I thinking? You know, I mean, he just had the right idea, and I just said, I'd missed the point. So, you know, I mean, there was a lot of work to be done, but he just was looking at it from a slightly different perspective. And, uh, and so this sort of unlocked it. Um, Brendel, uh, my colleague Simon Brendel, understood the case mu equals zero and beta less than equal to one half using sort of a very direct adaptation of Donaldson's ideas, but he proved the existence there, so there's a lot of work to be done. And then the, 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 um, uh, uh, the theory that now exists is that, so the uh, three of us, Jeffers and uh, uh, Yanir Rubinstein and I, proved the existence when D is just a smooth divisor last year, and uh, Yanir and I are finishing up the case of general divisors now. So... Um, Beta, remember, is the cone, 2 pi beta is the cone angle, okay? So beta less than or equal to 1 half turns out to be analytically much simpler. Now, since you all have been hearing about cones and initial roots and so on, the reason it's simpler is that when beta is less than or equal to 1 half, there's some linearized problem that has an initial root 0, and then all its other initial roots are bigger than 1, right? The minute the cone angle crosses to bigger than 1 half and close to 1, all of a sudden, you have a bunch of initial roots in the range between 0 and 1 that prevents unique self-adjoint extensions. There are all sorts of, you know, they, they prevent um, the analysis from going through in the simplest possible way, and they're even more unpleasant when you're doing the nonlinear arguments. So, so in any case, there's a, a sharp cutoff in the, uh, in the, let's say, the level of complexity at, at cone angle pi, which is beta is equal to 1 half. And the applications all demand being able to get up to cone angle close to 2 pi. So that was, in some sense, the big innovation of what we could do. The problem is analytically definitely simpler in uh, the case of beta less than or equal to 1 half. So in the last 
uh, 10 minutes, I want to give you some idea of the, the proof because there were a number of new, uh, new things here. And I was fortunate to collaborate with Yannir Rubinstein, who's you know, a great expert in uh, complex Mont-Jampère equations. And he, had, he brought a lot of interesting ideas that made this possible. So the classical Yao method, Aubin Yao method, was that you, you have this problematic term here. If f were 0, you'd be done. So you just deform it away. So what you do is you say, take the family of equations where you put an extra parameter t in here. Right? When t is equal to 0, there's trivially a solution, namely phi is equal to 0. Of course, it's the wrong problem, but you've solved it. Right? And now you deform gradually to the right problem. You let t vary between 0 and 1. Okay? So what you want to do is look at the set of t's where you do have a solution and show it's both open and closed. This is the continuity method that's standard in many problems in nonlinear elliptic theory and beyond. So the openness is, should just be an implicit function theorem. You know, if you have a solution at one point, and then this is the sort of thing that Donaldson studied, you know, you need to just show that you have solutions nearby. And you try to do that by an implicit function theorem. The closeness, well, like I say, and even in the compact smooth case, this is where, you know, Yao did an enormous amount of hard work, and uh, it's, it's very complicated. But there's sort of a pretty good scheme for doing it. Once again, it involves on motor, motor iteration and a priori estimates of the higher derivatives of this, of this uh, function phi. So these are the sorts of things that one has to face in this thing. And I want to give you a little bit of an indication because this turns out to be um, difficult, but uh, once you sort of understand the linear theory well enough, as I've been trying to convince you now, there are a lot of tech tools to do from various points of view. This becomes a tractable problem once you choose the function spaces properly. And that turns out to be sort of a, there are a couple of reasonable choices philosophically, and uh, it turns out that if you settle on one, that turns out to be really the right key. Okay, um, so what we're after is uh, a priori estimates. You have this family of solutions. Remember, going back to here, we have the solution phi sub t, which is the solution for the deformed problem at parameter value t. And you want to show the closedness means, suppose you have a sequence tj where you have a solution at those values of j. You'd like to say that you can take a limit of those solutions. Well, if you happen to have a priori estimates on the third derivatives, the first zero, first, second, and third derivatives of those of those Kähler factors, Kähler potentials, then you can take a limit in C2, which is what you need to do. Okay. So uh, Yao set up a, and Oba had set up a very interesting scheme. Um, the C2. So it turns out that you you, you want to prove a C0 estimate, C2 estimate, and a C3 estimate. C1 comes along sort of for free. Okay. And Aubin had realized that there was a, a simple way of getting a C2 estimate and then a C3 estimate. And the C0 estimate in the mu negative case is sort of just the maximum principle. I mean, it's a very easy argument. When mu is equal to zero, you have to use much more complicated techniques. And this is, again, what you know, uh, was a big deal for Yao in the 70s, I mean, his discovery of this. And the point I want to make is that the C2 estimates rely on boundedness of what's called the bisectional curvature. So this is just a particular part of the curvature tensor for complex manifolds. So you're just evaluating the curvature tensor on certain pairs of vectors. Okay, not every pair. So it's more than the Ricci tensor, but it's less than the full curvature tensor. And the C2 estimate relies on a lower bound for this bisectional curvature. Okay, the C3 estimate, well, Oba and Yao had a rather intricate way of doing it. Now this is regarded as, you know, quote unquote standard in the sense that there's some enormously difficult and influential and famous papers by uh, Craig Evans and uh, Krilov to say that if you know that you have C0 and C2 bounds, then you can get a C3 or a C2 alpha bound, which is all you need. Okay. So in some sense, we regard this as just sort of known technology that if you have C0 and C2, then you can go to C2 alpha. So that's sort of taking advantage of things. So we want to implement the same strategy in this, in this setting. We want to find Keeler-Einstein edge metrics, which are bent along a simple divisor or an iterated divisor. And you want to start off with some good guess. So you want to start off with an initial Kähler metric that has the right geometry, even though it's not Kähler-Einstein. Right? So what you want to do is you want to find a metric G, which has the right cone angles in its Kähler. And the cohomological condition I wrote down for you, I didn't belabor, but this sort of analog of Gauss-Binet, tells you that you can just write one down. So if you don't have that cohomological condition, you can't. And if you do, then there's sort of an obvious one you can write down. Okay? So there it is. And then you want to define a continuity path and do the same sort of thing. You want to deform this gradually to, to the right thing. And unfortunately, the problem is that um, Yao's continuity path doesn't work for reasons I'll try to describe. 
So just to be clear about what this model metric looks like, well, so you find this initial metric and its model at a simple, uh, at, a, at a crossing divisor, it looks like a product of things like this plus a Euclidean factor. Now, these things look not very conic, but uh, I hope I did this on a, another slide here. Uh, nope. Let me just sort of point this out here, that if I have mod z to the 2 beta minus 2 dz squared, just as a two-dimensional metric, right, and I have, let's say, z is equal to rho e to the i theta, then there's actually a change of variables. If I take, uh, let's say, um, sorry, write it this way, suppose I take r is equal to rho to the beta divided by beta, is I think what I want to do. So I take the polar variable, and I take a funny power of it, but I leave the angular variable alone. Then you can just compute the change of variables here. This is equal to dr squared plus beta squared r squared d theta squared. Namely, it's a cone. So this is just the conformal representation of a cone in two dimensions. This is a complex cone in one complex dimension. Okay, so I have a product of cones across each of these divisors plus something that's happening where all of the zk's vanish, so in the remaining variables. And how do I geometrize this? Remember, this is the model case in local coordinates. Well, I take sections which define these line bundles, and I take dd bar of these raised to certain powers. Okay, so this is sort of the quote-unquote, you know, easy Kähler metric that you can write down that does the job, but is not Kähler-Einstein. It has the right geometry, but it doesn't have the right, I mean, it has the right uh, asymptotic geometry, but it's not Kähler-Einstein. Okay, so here's the big problem, that exactly in this sort of harder regime when the betas are bigger than one half, so when you're out of what I call the orbifold regime, so when you're between cone angle pi and 2 pi, the bisectional curvature, the thing that you needed to be bounded below in order to make the C2 estimates work, isn't. In some sense, it never is. So, I mean, you know, you can write down easy metrics where it is, but, you know, typically there's, a, there's really an obstruction to it being bounded below. So it diverges to minus infinity. So this is the big problem, that that method just falls apart completely. And so what we need to do is uh, find a new continuity path, study the linearized operator, and find new a priori estimates. So that's sort of what needed to be done. And here's sort of the continuity path that we choose. It's, it's sort of just a very subtle variation. Do you remember before what we did was we put a parameter t, or what Yao did, was you put a parameter t in front of the f, here, we put a parameter s in front of the phi. So in fact, what we're doing is we're solving the problem with different, uh, uh, different Ricci curvatures. So you're solving a whole family of Einstein-like problems for different s's, all the way down to s goes to minus infinity. Okay? So when s is very, very negative, it turns out that this isn't so hard to solve. And then you try to push this up by opening closed arguments all the way to s is equal to mu, which is the problem you want to solve. Okay? Uh, and in fact, why not add both parameters, t and f? You look at a two-parameter continuity path. Okay, so you can deform away both f and t, both f and v. So that's the idea. And uh, this was, uh, so using this sort of new deformation was something that had come up in, in Rubinstein's thesis when he was looking at something called the Kähler-Einstein iteration. And as I pointed out, when s is very negative, it's not so hard to find a solution. Okay, uh, this is the change of coordinates, which I described before. And here's what the Laplacian looks like. We've seen this formula before, so I can zoom by it. And uh, what are the function spaces to use? Well, you can either differentiate with respect to these vector fields. These are the unit length vector fields with respect to this incomplete edge metric. So this would be quite reasonable, and this is exactly what Donaldson introduced in the problem. Or you can use the edge vector fields, which are just scaled versions of exactly the same thing. And that turns out to be more effective for various reasons. These have a lot of features, uh, advantages, which you, uh, many of you know very well. And here's something uh, which is kind of interesting, and it harkens back to all this discussion of essential self-adjointness and various things that we did before. Namely, I take one of these function spaces, either the wedge or the edge function space, I look at the set of u's such that Laplacian u lies in that same function space. Right? And again, why is this sort of any remarkable thing, that if u lies in this, then Laplace and u lies in the same space? The answer is typically that if u lies in this, then Laplace and u should be two orders worse. It should, it should blow up like r to the minus 2. So in order to lie in this function space, you have to understand what the cancellations are. And unfortunately, you're doing this in holder spaces because it's a nonlinear problem rather than Sobolev spaces. So there's a lot of what seemed to me at first, in this, you know, 10, 12 years ago when I first thought about this, a lot of very unpleasant... Um, sort of hard analysis about the Holder theory that uh, 
you know, I didn't understand how to do. And it had to do exactly with regularity along the edge. So if I take a function in the holder space that is in this holder Friedrichs domain, I'd like to know how regular is the first term in the asymptotic expansion along the edge. And the point is it lives in some negative bezel, uh, Besov space that I couldn't quite characterize. It's a bit of a problem. So I know I'm at the end. Let me just um, say a few more things. Uh, what we're interested in, saying you've seen this expansion before, you expect you, and this is a two-dimensional problem. Remember, co-dimension two, so the singular part at along a single, single divisor, the worst that you expect is a log blow-up. And we're choosing the Friedrich extension, which means that the log term is gone. So that's just a choice of inverse for the Laplacian. And Donaldson's big idea was just to notice that we don't actually need to control every second derivative. I mean, it's something that if you think hard about complex geometry, which I unfortunately hadn't and didn't and don't, you know, I, I, you know it's, it's an obvious point, but it's, there it is, that the things that you really need to control are not the, all the real derivatives of G, you just need to control the complex derivatives. And in fact, you don't even need all the complex derivatives. For second derivatives, you just need the D, D bar derivatives, D, Z, I, D, Z, G bar derivatives. And remarkably, those particular combinations are much easier to control. So this was his big idea. It was, just, it was a beautiful discovery. So the real derivatives give you all sorts of terms which you don't know how to control, and these complex derivatives don't. Um, so there's our theorem that you can take what I call these Reese potential operators. You take the Green's function for the Laplacian, and you look at these particular derivatives, and these are bounded on these holder spaces. So, uh, and in fact, you get a stronger theorem when the cone angles are less than pi. Okay, um, the only other thing I want to mention, so let me just uh, zoom by this. The, 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 the C0 estimates are turned turn out to be sort of a lot of things. And the C2 estimate, I just want to mention one more thing, is that this is exactly where the bisectional curvature bound turns out. And this is another innovation that uh, Anir Rubinstein was aware of, and it, and it turned out to be sort of really unlock some very important things, which is that, um, as I told you, we cannot rely on a lower bound for bisectional curvature because curvature, it just doesn't exist in this category. So it turns out that there's a generalization of the Schwartz lemma from complex analysis. So it's something that proved by Chern and Liu in the late 60s which has a very different looking form, but in fact, it gives you uh, the bounds that you need. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't say too much about it. It gives you the bounds that you need, provided the bisectional curvature is bounded from above and not below. So it's just kind of a weird, stupid thing that somehow this estimate just relies on upper bounds for bisectional curvature rather than lower bounds. And then the miracle, which you know, nobody expected, was that you always have upper bounds in bisectional curvature. So that's a hard calculation, but it turns out to be true. Okay, so I've gone over time, and so forgive me for doing that, but I wanted to explain that in some sense the, you know, there were a number of sort of hard nonlinear things in this argument, which I was very lucky to have my uh, uh, collaborators on, and then, you know, I really needed sort of the full force of what I knew about edge calculus to, to make this work. And uh, it's, it's, like I say, the hard bit was getting between pi and 2 pi because everything that was known about these types of equations beforehand breaks down. So you have to really reinvent the wheel for that gap. And it turned out to be remarkably possible. So I'll stop there.